All right, everyone, it's almost April, so polling becomes more important, and it also becomes a little bit more accurate at this point because polling firms, for the general, because the primaries are over, they're going to get more numbers in, generally speaking. Biden's approval seems to have stabilized. It's hit sort of its natural limit beyond which it doesn't go unless he does something really fucked up. Um, and, and it's not pretty because this is in the absence of any other major recent blunders. I mean, the border crisis popping off has forced his approval down. It's below 40, by the way, uh, just below 40. And at this same time in their presidencies, Trump was at about 47 points and Obama around the same, around 48. Um, that is a significant difference. And when you look at the election matchup polling again, for the Biden camp, if you happen to be a Democrat and partisan or just a fan of Biden for some ideological reason, I don't know why you would be, but there are some people out there that are, it's inexplicable, then you're probably uh, shitting bricks right now. When you look at the differential in matchup polling, in competitive state polling, in approval polling, Biden is so deeply underwater that it's almost impossible for him to actually get reelected unless something major changes. Now, what he's uh, stabilized at is his soft floor. And so the remnant approval that you do see there, when, when I look at these numbers, it's fairly clear what's happened. He's been shaved down to certain single-issue voters, Democratic partisans, and natural left-leaning individuals who want to stop Trump because they're afraid that he's a fascist, and so they're supporting him maybe uh, in general. Although, the fact that you approve of somebody doesn't mean you necessarily vote for them. Uh, that's the other, the other uh, problem. The, the needle in the haystack that you need to find is, what's the magic number of people who say, I prefer Biden over Trump, but then when they get to the ballot box, they say, well, I, I really can't vote for him because I don't like him either, and they vote for Jill Stein or Cornell West. What's the proportion of people who naturally would be inclined to vote for, let's say, RFK Jr., who is a, who is a leftist, um, but then they get to the ballot box and they say, well, but I'm really afraid of this Biden dude, or hey, I'm really afraid of this Trump dude. And I think that in the end, the polling narrows some, because I think that some of those voters actually break for Joe Biden. Is it going to be enough, though, to get him over the hurdle of being so far behind in so many states? having such terrible approval numbers, I wouldn't imagine so. I would imagine that, again, if the election were held right now, I think that Trump would run away with it. He'd win all of the competitive states or, or maybe lose one or two of them. He may be in competitive in Maine. I'd like to see more polling there, but the approval couldn't be more stark. Joe Biden's disapproval level also came somewhat uncoupled from the approval. And the big analysis, and I think I'm the only one that pointed this out actually, and I'm, I'm surprised that someone who's more of an expert statistician didn't key in on this, is that if you've got like a two to one uh, increase in one and decrease in the other, if there's, if there's a significant differential, then the only thing that you can chalk that up to is independent voters. You, you can't say that it's Dem partisans or something like that. Those have to, those have to be left-leaning independent voters that have switched to disapproving Biden. Again, their disapproval of Biden does not mean approval of Trump. Just like if somebody disapproves of Trump, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a fan of Joe Biden. You've got lies, damned lies, and statistics. Trying to parse all the numbers apart is an impossible task that shouldn't even be attempted because it's impossible. Uh, but you can get a general bead on it. Donald Trump managed to supposedly, Hong Kong, lose the last election while running well behind in the polls. If you stack it up, the, the polling that we see now based on 2020 metrics, um, Trump has had an increase of about uh, seven or eight points or thereabouts, actually a little bit more than that. In some states, it's a double digit gain. Um, in the polling, he only lost by a few tens of thousands of votes in those same sensitive states. The big problem also becomes how many people on the voter rolls aren't technically eligible to vote in a system where quite clearly, no matter what the election result is, it'll be litigated against nonstop, but there will never be any closure because of state laws with regards to things like voter, uh, voter ID, uh, mail-in ballots, etc., certification, and then also, you know, actually retaining the ballot so that they can be gone through by an independent third party, should there be any uh, shenanigans that are uh, detected or suspected. And the answer is uh, there will be shenanigans in the 2020 election. 
probably to the tune of many hundreds of thousands of votes. The ballot printers will go burr. There will be dead people voting. There will be illegals voting, etc. And there's nothing that we can do about it. What I prescribe, therefore, is that since Biden is such a weak candidate, since he comes in so far behind where he was at in 2020, and Trump has leapfrogged ahead of even where he was in 2016, when he won, fair and square, no, it was not Russians that caused that, it was the American voting public. Yes, I realize he didn't win the popular vote, and Joe Biden's the most popular man ever with 80 million scoops of ice cream. Really, what I would prescribe is over the coming months, if everyone just dedicated themselves to doing something even minuscule, uh, if, if several million people, so a drop in the bucket of the voting population, were, for example, to just drag one friend to the polls, were to harvest one ballot, knock on a dozen doors or something, something that would take them, uh, in, in some cases, almost no effort or time whatsoever, get a, a couple of people registered to vote, or like, well, yeah, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to register to vote. Oh, here, well, let me help you out. I suggest that you all uh, follow Scott Pressler and go to his site. Uh, that is probably the best place to learn how to do these things. Some of you, you're eligible to vote, but you're not registered to vote. Guaranteed. It could be hundreds or even thousands of people that see this video that fall under that category. You're a voting age in the United States, but you either don't vote or you haven't registered to be able to vote. Well, now is the time to do it. I mean, that moves the needle. That's, that's again, potentially hundreds or thousands of people based on just this one audience. And if you can replicate that by telling others about that, then, you know, you've got it. There aren't enough ballot printers in the world to overcome uh, what would happen. You'd need millions and millions of ballots scattered across a number of states, and it would look a little bit too obvious. Those lawsuits would probably retroactively have an impact, unlike the lawsuits in like Maricopa and places like that that generally fell through. Yes, I do understand that there were obvious shenanigans, but I mean... We're talking a different order of magnitude of obviousness. Okay, a few tens of thousands of ballots here, maybe a couple thousand over there, and we've got it in the bag. Okay, that's easy to pull off, especially when you run the legal system. But what if it's millions? It's going to be a lot harder to hide that. They're going to have to do more than put up paper in the windows of the uh, vote counting place to keep the uh, cameras from being able to peek in on what they're doing, for example. Uh, you would need a much more sophisticated system one that I don't know that they've had the uh, time and resources to actually implement without getting caught. Because if they were to try to implement such a system, eventually you'd think because of the manpower involved, there would be a whistleblower or something like that. So I have a feeling that right now they're basically uh, crossing their fingers and hoping, uh, saying a little prayer to Moloch or something like that, that Donald Trump manages to slip up or that Joe Biden manages to actually do something, accomplish something that uh, not just partisans like. Um, I think that's basically their strategy, that and lawfare. They're also hoping to uh, nail Donald Trump on at least one felony charge in hopes that that declines his popularity. But I don't know. I, I mean, the, the, the polling on that is confusing too. And some polls say he actually gains support. I don't know what would end up happening. I mean, I know it would make me, I mean, there's a 100% chance I vote for Trump, so it's not going to change anything. But if I were on the fence, I would think him being persecuted to that level would actually make me more inclined to vote. I think it depends on uh, what kind of independent voter you are. If you lean left, probably it turns you off more to him. If you lean right, probably it turns you on more to him. So it's probably about even Stevens. I don't see that necessarily having any real impact at all. And all of these people in the legacy media would be shaking their heads with incredulity at that point. What are the American people thinking? How can Trump still be almost tied with Joe Biden? He's a felon. He's got an ankle monitor, for Christ's sake. Haven't we lost our minds? I mean, the news reports write themselves, the hyperbole and all that. Imagine Don Lemon's response. Imagine Krugman's response. Oh boy, that would be a funny one. That's about all. Peace out.